Hello there. This is the comic book that first introduced me to the remarkable true story that I'm about to tell you. It had a huge impact on me as a young Christian and has had on so many others down through the years. It's the story of five young Christian men from the United States. When I say they were Christian, I don't mean they were just born in a Christian country, so-called, or into a Christian family, but they'd undergone each a conversion experience and come to personal faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior by the grace of God. Jim Elliott was a student of ancient languages at Wheaton College and a successful sportsman. He's remembered for that quotation, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And his desire was to work in Bible translation. Age 20, he wrote in his diary, I only hope that God will let me preach to those who have never heard the name of Jesus. What else is worthwhile in this life? I have heard of nothing better. He goes on, saturate me with the oil of God that I may be a flame. But flame is transient, often short lived. Can you bear this, my soul, short life? In me there dwells the spirit of the great short lived, whose zeal for God's house consumed him. Make me your fuel, flame of God. In 1950, Jim heard about evangelistic work being carried out among the Quechua tribe in the Amazon rainforest. And he prayed, Lord, send me. I dare not stay home while Quechua's perish. Pete Fleming had a master's degree in English literature and was heading for a career as a college professor. But he too had a fervent desire to serve his savior. In a letter, he quoted the following words of the Lord Jesus. He that loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that doesn't take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Moved in his heart by the strength of those words, he soon announced that he would be going as a missionary to South America. Many colleagues were astonished. How could he throw his life away as they saw it, helping ignorant savages? Nevertheless, Pete Fleming and Jim Elliott set sail for Ecuador in 1952. Ed McCulley was studying law at university when the Lord spoke to him through the story of Nehemiah. He wrote, here was a man, Nehemiah, who left everything as far as position was concerned to go do a job nobody else could handle. And because he went, the whole remnant back in Jerusalem got right with the Lord. Feeling challenged, he wrote to Jim Elliot like this. I have one desire now to live a life of reckless abandon to the Lord, putting all my energy and strength into it. Maybe he'll send me some place where the name of Jesus Christ is unknown. Well, Ed also arrived in Ecuador during 1952. Roger Uderian, who had nearly died of polio as a child, had been an army chaplain's assistant with the paratroopers during World War II. As he served in that capacity, he also increasingly felt he should go into full-time Christian service. And having seen action in jungle conditions already, he left for Ecuador in 1953. Now, missionaries there in those days were fairly cut off from civilization. If there was an emergency, it would mean many days dangerous trekking through the jungle. But in 1945, an organization had been set up to send trained pilots to help take the gospel to remote parts of the world, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship, or MAF. They sent Nate Saint to Ecuador. Nate had wanted to be a military pilot, but could not because of ill health. So he had prayed about his future. And sure enough, the Lord opened this other door of opportunity, flying planes for MAF. He too had an intense passion for souls and desired to bravely take the name of Jesus to people who had never heard it before. With his Piper aeroplane, traveling across the jungle was obviously much quicker. He could carry medicines and supplies easily and evacuate medical emergencies for treatment when necessary. So here were five very different men united in their love for Christ and their desire to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. They left their comfortable homes in the US 
for Ecuador, and each was accompanied by his wife, while Jim, Ed, Nate, and Roger also already had children. Ecuador is part of Western South America and includes much of the tropical rainforest that surrounds the Amazon River, one of the last places on Earth to be fully explored. It is populated by many indigenous tribes. At first, Jim, Pete and Ed took God's message of new life in Christ to the Quichuas, while Roger worked along with others among the Shuar tribe. These were headhunters, famous for shrinking and wearing their enemies' heads. But all five men soon heard of another tribe called the Warani. They were so primitive and fierce that even the Kachuas and the Shua feared them, nicknaming them the Aukas, which was their word for naked savages. This was because they wore no clothes at all except decorative strings on their wrists and waists. They wore two inch diameter wooden plugs in their sagging earlobes. And they often had six fingers because of inbreeding. Few people even knew they existed and no one had yet met them and come back alive. The Warani's world consisted of land between two rivers that flow into the Amazon, the Napo and the Kurure. All outsiders, whatever their race, they called Kawudi, or eaters of people, and they hated them all. Wielding barbed nine-foot spears or blow darts, they killed anyone who came into their territory. In fact, they even killed each other. And in four groups, they hid in the forest, carrying out surprise attacks so that few of the men even lived beyond their 20s. By 1955, there were only 500 Warani left and outsiders knew hardly any words in their language, which had never been written down. So they also referred to them as the Alcas. Surely these were unreachable people. Most of us would never have contemplated trying to reach them, but with God, all things are possible. The five missionary evangelists joined together in a secret mission, alone with their families, and then together they prayed, planned, and prepared. But how could they prove their friendly intent to a people who hated all outsiders? How could they even get close enough to give presents, which was the usual way of approaching uh, a new uh, tribe, uh, without being killed? Never mind learn their language and share the gospel. Well, Nate Saint was an inventor as well as a pilot. He practiced flying his Piper plane in a tight circle with the door off so that a bucket could be reeled out on a long line holding a gift. In this way, on October the 6th, 1955, he flew over one of the Warani villages of palm thatched huts and dropped an aluminium kettle with colored streamers on to draw attention to it. Inside, they had put some bright buttons and a bag of rock salt. It landed on a beach of the river Kurare, not far from Warani homes. Every week, Nate dropped other gifts such as machetes, axe heads, shirts and shorts. For a while, nothing happened. Then on November the 12th, 1955, the Warani took an axe head and replaced it with a crown of feathers. During 13 drops, other return gifts followed, including fruit and a live parrot. The five men were overjoyed with this progress. Meanwhile, Jim hiked from one Kachua village to another to meet with Nate's sister, Rachel, who was working with Wycliffe Bible translators among that tribe. In God's providence, a teenage Warani girl called Bayuma had fled from the village, having been threatened with death. And this gave them the chance to learn some words in the unwritten Warani language from her. In turn, Jim taught the other four still praying about their mission impossible. All the men and their wives were aware that meeting the Warani on the ground could result in death. The Bible says in 1 John, perfect love casts out fear 
and their love for the lost souls of the Warani and their desire to share the message of God's forgiveness with them overcame any fears that they had. By January the 2nd, 1956, they felt sure some of the Warani considered them to be friendly. They gathered at an abandoned Shell Oil Company outpost on the edge of Kichua and Warani territory. It had been abandoned in 1948 because 12 Shell Oil workers had been speared to death. From there, it was a 15 minute flight to the beach of the river Kurare where the gifts had been dropped. They codenamed it Palm Beach. On the morning of Tuesday, the 3rd of January, they made radio contact with their wives, each prayed aloud, and then they sang a favorite hymn to the tune Finlandia, a hymn by Edith Cherry. The final verse summed up the months of preparation and expressed their complete trust in God. We rest in thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle, thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, Victors, we rest with thee through endless days. They then made six flights, steeply landing each time between tall trees on a 200 yard strip of Palm Beach, stopping just six feet from the water. The six flights were needed to ferry the five men, their radios, more gifts, and a prefabricated treehouse to build 35 feet above ground so they could sleep safe from surprise attacks. On the last flight, they called out over a loudspeaker words in the Warani language, come tomorrow to the river Kurare. Each night, three stayed in the treehouse while Nate and one other took the plane back to safety. The Warani trashed anything they found, usually. They also maintained regular radio contact with their wives. On Wednesday, the 4th of January, they walked about holding gifts, calling out towards the jungle. In his diary that night, Nate thanked the Lord Jesus for such a good team. On Thursday, the 5th of January, the gifts they had left below the treehouse remained untaken, but from the air they spotted fresh footprints. They were being watched. At last, on the 6th of January, a young man, Nankiwi, a teenage girl, Gimari, and a woman, Mintaka, appeared. The missionaries welcomed them with every Warani word they'd learned, and the Warani replied. They accepted the gift of a machete and a model of the airplane. The man showed that he wanted to go in the plane, so Nate gave him a flight over the village so he could call down to his people. Some looked delighted, others confused. After landing, they tried to explain using sticks and the model that they would like to land nearer the village if they could clear an airstrip for them. Of course, they longed to bridge the language barrier so they could share the gospel. But for now, they simply showed friendship with their gifts and not words. Eventually, the three Warani slipped back into the forest. On Saturday, the 7th of January, no Warani came. So the five missionaries read, wrote, swam and practiced their Warani words. But as Nate flew over the village the following day on his way back to meet the others, he spotted a group of nine men making their way towards Palm Beach. At 12.30 p.m., Nate radioed his wife Marge and said, looks like they'll be here for the early afternoon service. Pray for us. This is the day. We'll contact you at 4.30 p.m. At that time, Marge Saint tuned in but heard nothing. The Warani men had speared to death all five of the missionaries, then thrown their bodies in the river along with their possessions before finally stripping the piper of its canvas. It was Sunday the 8th of January, 1956. Going back to Jim Elliott's diary, at the age of 21, he'd written, I seek not a long life, but a full one, like you, Lord Jesus. And at 23, he'd said, I must not think it strange if God takes in youth those whom I would have kept on earth till they were older. God is peopling eternity, and I must not restrict him to old men and women. Well, he went to people eternity at just 28. He had also written in that diary, when it comes to die, make sure all you have to do is die. That is, be right with God now through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They had carried guns, but refused to shoot at those they had come to witness to, instead only firing in the air as they were attacked. Warani women who'd followed the raiding party had watched from the ridge, and both they and the men later reported that after the killings, the sky turned dark very quickly, but then was lit up by a huge group of singing, shining figures. In 1993, that scene was painted by Nate Saint's brother. Perhaps they were angels ushering the five martyrs through the gates of pearly splendor of which they had earlier sung, much like heaven opening to receive Stephen, the first Christian martyr in Act 7. Well, a massive ground and air search was launched, led by Frank Drown, who for 12 years had been a missionary to the Shuar headhunters. And they were helped by fellow missionaries, medics, Ecuadorian soldiers, and even members of the Quechua tribe. As she waited for news, Jim's wife, Elizabeth, was comforted by Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. She earnestly prayed while continuing to teach her Kachua children's reading class. Ed McCulley's wife prepared food for the volunteers searching for her husband. And the five wives with their children, along with Rachel Saint, soon met up together and amazed those around them by their serenity. Five days later, the bodies of the men were recovered. As the search party buried them on Palm Beach, themselves risking their lives, once again the sky turned black and a terrible tropical storm blew up. Frank Drown knelt by the graves and prayed that many Warani would become believers in Jesus because the five men had died for his sake and been buried in their land. The widows too in their grief with a total of nine fatherless children were assured that God had a plan in allowing their husbands to be killed. Pete's wife, Olive, recorded on tape her thoughts about Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. She said, our future is in God's hands. Only to those who believe does life have any meaning. Those who know God have life. He has promised us fullness of joy. He is the God of all comfort. And as our hearts and minds are stayed on him, our lives are filled with joy. But as we look to ourselves and take our thoughts off the altogether lovely one, we lose our joy. He has promised us pleasure forevermore. This promise is not only for now, but for eternity. Roger's wife, Barbara, said, The Lord has closed our hearts to grief and hysteria and filled in with his perfect peace. Not only is this the story of those courageous servants of God going to a people who they knew were likely to murder anyone who came near, but of their wives, children and families who also gave up their loved one for the Lord. Well, the story does not end there. It may have seemed, humanly speaking, like a tragic waste of young life, but God was working out his purposes. All things work together for good. Of course, they were alive and well with the Lord in heaven. But though they never had the chance to witness directly to the Morani, others did. God never wastes the blood of his saints. If the five men were courageous, then so were members of their families. How could such a violent people ever understand the gospel? But a loving God, rejected by his people, would send his son to save them, and that when he was killed, he would respond by offering forgiveness for sin. Perhaps they were helped by the lives of the martyrs and their relatives who still came back to help those who had murdered their husbands. By 1958, Nate's sister Rachel and Elizabeth Elliot made contact with the Warani again when they accompanied Dayuma back to her tribe. One of the reasons the Alka men allowed them back was the way in which the five men had not offered resistance when attacked. Rachel Saint lived among them for the remaining 41 years of her life. As a result uh, of her work, today the Warani have the New Testament in their own language. Elizabeth Elliot wrote the most famous account of their story, taking the title from the hymn they'd sung, Through Gates of Splendour. 
She brought up her daughter Valerie among the tribe. Other workers joined them. The killers explained that they had thought they would be eaten by foreigners. Eventually, they did begin to see conversions in the tribe. The gospel was explained to them, and many who had felt tremendously guilty since the killings came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ themselves. One by one, seven out of the nine men who had speared the missionaries to death came to faith and were saved. One of them, Kimo, became the village pastor as they formed a church. The amount of killing decreased and so their numbers grew to about 2,000 in more recent years, of whom a quarter became born-again believers. Some became missionaries to other tribes who had long been their enemies. A man called Tona was himself martyred while witnessing to others. And in 1966, Nate's two teenage children, Steve and Kathy, were baptised alongside two teenage Warani in the river Kururai by two of their father's killers. Near the spot where the men died, they all sang again the hymn, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Our Defender. Steve and his family went back to live among them in 1995, where he assisted the Warani church and oversaw the building of a hospital and an airport. He became great friends in particular with Minkai, one of the men who had speared his father to death and who would accompany him on preaching tours uh, across the states and elsewhere, telling his testimony. Truly, as Isaiah says, a people who had walked in darkness had seen a great light. As Steve Saint said, God took five common young men with uncommon commitment and used them for his glory. Well, how can we apply this miraculous story? First, let there be no doubt that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, changes lives. Paul tells us in the New Testament that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. He should know he too was a murderer, a persecutor of the early Christians. But the Lord Jesus met him and changed him. No wonder he wasn't ashamed of it. No wonder he called it the power of God. But this message is not only for murderers or bank robbers. We're all sinners. But having confessed our sin to God, to be in Christ is simply to believe that when he died on the cross, he was paying for uh, your sin personally as well as for others, because that was the only way to get you to heaven. The gospel also liberates communities where the pure message of the Bible goes. Spiritual healing leads to social healing and true liberty. It was J.C. Ryle who said this. The upper room was the starting point of a movement which shook the Roman Empire, emptied the heathen temples, stopped gladiatorial combats, raised women to their true position, checked infanticide, created a new standard of morality and turned the world upside down. And what was the secret of this power? The presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit. It was true at the Reformation. It was true when William Carey went to India and stopped that wicked practice of burning widows on funeral pyres, or when Wilberforce led the campaign to abolish slavery, or when so many other evangelical Christians we could name pioneered free education and provision for the poor. Let's just turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, verse 55 to verse 58. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That passage teaches us a number of things. Firstly, even in the face of death, in Christ, we can have the victory. The sting of death, the victory of the grave, held no sway over those men and their families. Clearly, God gave freely of his grace to the men at the hour of their martyrdom and to their families afterwards. To have done what they did 
to go where they went, so ready to obey the call of God. They must have so trusted the Lord that they understood that to live is Christ, to die is gain. If we are forgiven sinners, if we've been to the cross of Jesus in repentance and put our trust in him, then he gives us the victory. He who has conquered death for us. And um, we've all got to face that. But whatever happens to us physically, we can know we have the victory through him. We have eternal life. Are we abounding in the work of the Lord? We should be challenged by this story to serve our God. We have things so easy today. How many of us would have gone to the Warani? I think that we could do with some of those converted savages, so-called, to come and re-evangelize countries like ours. We've been so blessed with freedom, yet surrounded by so many souls in darkness. So many today don't know what the Christian gospel really is, what grace means, what Jesus has done for those he calls to trust him. And we don't face the end of a spear from those we're called to reach. We won't all be martyrs. For Romans 12 verse 2 calls us all to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Are we doing that? And finally, your labor is not in vain. Those men never saw the results of their work. Yet this did not mean that that work didn't bear fruit. All was unfolding according to God's perfect will. And God answered their prayers and fulfilled their godly ambitions after their short lives and far beyond their expectations. Reaching that tribe was humanly impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That can be like us. We sometimes see so few results in our evangelistic work. But if we are yielded to God's will, his work through us will glorify him. Here, take the promise of God's word. Your labor is not in vain. So may we all be both challenged and encouraged by this Remarkable story of those five men who were faithful unto death for Jesus' sake. Amen.